Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'm going to read a short selection and then go into the story of what happened on May 18th and afterwards. At first glance, Bath, Michigan looks like a place where nothing bad could happen. Located about 12 miles from the state capital of Lansing, Bath has that all-American feeling to it, a quintessential small town steeped in good Midwestern values. Bath itself has physically changed over the years, but its essential character has prevailed throughout the decades. In the spring, it is alive with green. The town was founded as a farming community, with corn and soybeans being the major crops. Sugar beets, which dwindled in popularity through the years, are making a comeback. There's also a dairy farm in the area, home to a large herd of Holsteins. In recent years, farmlands have been transformed into housing subdivisions and condominium complexes. The old Kehoe place west of town center was at one point being developed for condos, though these plans fell through. The land ceased to be a farm in 1927 and lay fallow for years. No one wanted to touch it. There are two main roads in Bath, Webster and Clark, which intersect at the town center. An elementary school and middle school are located near the crossroads. The high school is a short walk from these facilities. Schools in, Bath, in the Bath region were originally old-fashioned one-room schoolhouses. In 1922, the school district brought together this diffuse network in a single building for kindergartners through high school seniors. Today's trio of school buildings was constructed in the post-World War II years after the James Cousins Agricultural School, originally dedicated in 1928 and named after the senator who helped fund the building, finally outlived its usefulness. Across the street from the elementary and middle schools is a public park built on the site of the old school. The James Cousins Memorial Park is a sort of community catch-all. It's a wonderful place to relax, play with kids, read a book, walk the dog. At the center of the park is a white wooden tower, the original cupola from the roof of the Bath Consolidated School. It rises from the greens with sad elegance, a wooden vestige of what once stood on this land. A sign posted on the cupola tells the structure's history. The foot of the cupola is a brick pathway with names etched into 42 of the stones. Just beyond this is a marker erected by the state of Michigan in 1992, explaining the park's significance. Kitty corner from this marker is a boulder with a large plaque bolted to the stone face. The plaque lists the names of 38 children and four adults. The names of two other adults are conspicuous by their absence. South of the park is more greenery, the grounds and trees of Pleasant Hill Cemetery. The graveyard dates back to the late 19th century, and pretty much everyone in town is related to someone buried there. Mothers and fathers, daughters and sons, grandparents and grandchildren, generations bound by silence, rest together under family headstones. Pleasant Hill is well named. Its meditative stillness is broken only by the occasional sound of the passing car, the call of birds, or the noise of children wafting along the wind from the schools down Webster Road. Wandering through the cemetery, one sees a pattern emerging from the headstones. Emily, Mary, Emily Marion Bromant, 1916, 1927. Robert F. Bromant, 1914, 1927. Floyd E. Burnett, 1914, 1927. Russell J. Chapman, 1918, 1927. Ralph A. Cushman, 1919, 1927. Catherine Foote, 1916, 1927. Gail Lyle Hart, 1914, 1927. Laver Robert Hart, 1914, 1927. Stanley Hart, 1915, 1927. Dolores Elaine Johns, 1918, 1927. James Anderson, Emerson Medkoff, 1918, 1927. Emma Nichols, 1914, 1927. Richard Dibble, R Richard Dibble Richardson, 1914, 1927. Pauline M. Schertz, 1916, 1927. Harold Lemoyne Woodman, 1918, 1927. They're scattered like delicate leaves throughout the cemetery, these headstones of children, all sharing the 1927 date. These childhoods, so abruptly ended, still whisper through Bath like the muted song of a mournful choir. May 18th, 1927 started out as a perfect spring day, the air freshly scrubbed by a night's rain and fragrant with flowers. Within a few hours, the smell of lilacs and bloom was overtaken by the stench of smoke and dynamite, flame and blood. 
The north wing of the Bath Consolidated School was in ruins, destroyed from beneath by carefully planted explosives. A second blast left the hulking remains of a Ford truck at the school entrance. 36 children and two teachers died in the initial blast. The Ford explosion killed two adult bystanders and another child, as well as the school superintendent. One child hung on for three months before dying from her injuries. 58 children and adults were injured. To the west of the school, a farmhouse and surrounding buildings on the property were reduced to smoking embers. The next day, tied to a cart near the hen house, authorities found the charred remains of a body, too badly burned to determine its gender, but assumed by the overall circumstances to be a woman. A stenciled sign posted on a fence at the edge of the farm read, criminals are made, not born. Another man died when the Ford truck exploded. He was the owner of the burned farm. His final moments of life were a spectacular act of murder-suicide that capped his destruction of the school and farm. Andrew B. Kehoe was the dead man's name, and everyone in Bath knew who he was. What happened? On May 18, 1927, there was an explosion at the, uh, stand down. there was an explosion at the school. Um, people didn't know what had happened. They thought that the boiler had exploded. Essentially what happened was there was a loud boom about 8.30 in the morning. The school rose about four feet in the air and fell down. The roof collapsed from the second floor onto the first floor. Um, it was heard for miles. It was heard all the way here into Lansing. You could hear children screaming inside. Um, it, it, it just as bad as bad a situation could be. Um, people rushed in immediately. Everyone in town had a child in school there. There were estimated to be um, 275 or so children there that day. And everyone in town had a, had a, you know, someone they were either related to or had a child or something. Um, and a rescue effort started immediately. Um, and again, people did not know what happened. They thought a boiler had exploded. Simultaneously, um, a farm just west of town caught fire and the fire spread very rapidly. It was owned by a man named Andrew Kehoe who was a member of the school board. He was the treasurer, in fact, of the school board and a local farmer. As I said, the fire spread very rapidly. Um, you know, this being a farm town, you know, the farmers do what they do. They started, you know, going to the farm to help to put out the fire. Um, many of them didn't know what was going on at the school. Uh, one man, they, a group went in to the house. They didn't see Kehoe. They didn't see his wife, Nellie. And they were looking around. They, you know, started moving out some furniture. And then they saw dynamite planted in the house. And they got out very quickly, um, as you can imagine. And it blew. It just, you know, the house just, you know, things started exploding very quickly. Um, men were thrown down from the, you know, on the edge of the farm, things like that. And then word started coming back, the schoolhouse is blown. People had no clue what was going on. Um, it seemed like the end of the world. Um, the rescue effort continued. Um, there was a temporary morgue had been set up in front of the school on the lawn. Um, triage was going on on the lawn um, in people's homes. The superintendent of the school, uh, Emery Hike, was running from place to place trying to marshal a rescue effort. Um, there was a 17-year-old woman, Nora Bamcock, was the, uh, the telephone operator. It was the old-fashioned telephone system, you know, with the, uh, with the plug-ins, and it was the only way, only communication out. She was desperately calling into Lansing, help, we need help. Um, fire trucks slowly started coming in, ambulances, things like that. Um, people at, at the edge of Kehoe's farm, you know, they were still, wa you know, wondering what was going on there. They saw a truck by the barn, which was burning, the, tr um, the barn, and it pulled out. And Andrew Kehoe was behind the wheel. And he looked at them, he said, boys, you're friends of mine. You better get out of here. Go down to the school. And he drove off. They had no clue what he was talking about. Um, he drove down, pulled up on, in front of the school, and um, Emery Hike, the superintendent, saw him. Now, Hike and Kehoe had a real cantankerous relationship. Um, if any of you have ever sat on a school board or been involved with a school board, you know these are not necessarily, you know, um, the most civil of organizations. Um, and, you know, they fought back and forth, um, which, you know, happened. I mean, it was the way it was. And, but when Hike saw Kehoe's truck, he, all he thought was we have to rescue these kids. You know, let's throw out the animosities. You know, let's, let's, you know, we don't, we don't need to fight today. And he went up. He said, we need your truck. We need to get ladders. We need to get ropes. Kehoe looked at him and said, 
okay, I'll take you with me. 